Hey, everybody. Welcome to Cincinnati's Best Ever Real Estate Mastermind COVID webinar edition for November 2020. I'm really excited for uh, this conversation with Ash Patel, obnoxious ROIs in commercial real estate investing. For those of you who are here on Zoom for the first time, we use, you can chat. We also use the Q&A feature. I will be moderating the Q&A, getting you answers to your questions. Uh, I may answer it right there in type. Regardless, I'll make sure it gets answered. I'll either ask it directly then or get it put into my notes for this conversation with Ash. Additional bonus this time, if you are interested in being a speaker for a future meetup, please go to the Facebook group and comment your email address, your contact info in the post for this video, which is streaming live in the Facebook group right now. If you're watching in Facebook, I am not going to prioritize your questions because that's more work. Click on the Zoom link, come into Zoom and ask your questions there. Um, awesome. So Ash Patel, I, I know you personally more from poker than from real estate. Uh, I know you do commercial. You uh, tell me that I'm not making enough money doing residential and that I need to come over to the dark side. Tell, tell us your story. What got you into, what were you doing before real estate? What got you into real estate and what got you into commercial? Yeah. By the way, the title was Slocum's idea, not mine. But so uh, starting from the beginning, my career was in IT and 15 year career. Throughout those years, I always had a side hustle, uh, whether it was starting a web design company, marketing company, um, search engine company. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. Um, in 2012, I bought my first property, didn't know anything about real estate other than I heard it was passive income and great tax benefits. Didn't know what they were. So the first property that I bought was a mixed use building in Clifton, College Town. It was a grocery store with three apartments above it. Uh, really run down, a bad lease in place. And I thought it was perfect. Well, got in there, renovated it. And throughout the process of managing it, I had a pivotal moment and that was when I was on site trying to unclog a sink or a toilet. And I noticed when I looked out on the roof that there was a new HVAC system going in. And initially I panicked. I didn't know if I was going to have to pay for it. And I went downstairs to the store and I said, hey, what are you guys doing? Well, our AC went out, so we're putting a new unit in. And I didn't want to further that conversation so I went home and looked at the lease again and realized it's in their lease to fix all plumbing HVAC issues. If their windows break, it's on them. Uh, so I never heard from my commercial tenants. I would hear from the college kids quite often. The longer weekends, the more I hear from them. Um, so again, that pivotal, pivotal moment is what convinced me to go into commercial real estate. I didn't want the overhead, the headaches that most residential landlords have to deal with. So that's what started my career eight years ago in commercial real estate. 2012 was a good year to buy. So there was a lot sure. of vacant commercial buildings out there or half vacant and they were priced quite low. So just started buying one after another no two were the same. I went from a warehouse to an office building to a triple net strip mall. Uh, anything I thought I could make money at, I would try to take down. How did you learn about, how did you learn commercial real estate then in 2012, fresh into real estate investing to be able to recognize um, assets that were underperforming could be performing much better and would appreciate in value quickly. How did you learn to do that? I did not, not until the last couple of years that I really figured that out. But back then it was just going on a hunch. If I thought I could turn a property around and get it rented, uh, I would go after it. And I managed all of my own properties. So once I bought the property, 
it was me that would renovate it. It was me that would go out and try to find the tenants. I pounded the pavement to make sure I got a tenant in there. I didn't leave that to chance or to any other leasing brokers or commercial brokers. Did it all myself. And just building confidence, the more of them that I did and the more vacant buildings I was able to turn around, the more confident I was on taking down different types of assets. Nice. Have you found yourself uh, prioritizing or or wanting particular uh, assets in particular industries or particular types of commercial properties now that you've done that? No. The last one I took down was um, an industrial building in Dayton. Before that, it was a strip mall in Owensville. Before that, it was a restaurant in Norwood. So... Whenever the deals come by, I try to underwrite them and see if there's a way to make money and turn them around. So, no, it's just finding any type of deal that I think I can turn around. Let's let's talk about that. So, a couple a couple of things, Ash. I uh, and and the people who are watching know this. I am an apartment investor, and I also like to use this webinar. Uh, to ask all of my own questions and learn as much as I possibly can and take notes and just hope that everyone who's watching and listening gets something else as well. How do you, so, so coming from that perspective, I know what makes uh, an apartment deal attractive and, and, and my gut and my hunch is about what properties can turn around. How do you, how do you identify those properties in the commercial space? I mean, restaurant, warehouse, strip mall, how do you, what is it that you're looking for in regards to a property that can be turned around? So I think when you underwrite them, you look at comps. So if you look at vacant uh, restaurant buildings and see what they're going for, if you find a strip mall that has vacancies, you can look at what the existing tenants are paying per square foot. You can look at nicer strip malls in the area see what the top rate that people would pay. And then you look at some rundown strip malls and see what they're charging. You get a median price and that's a good way to underwrite it. Office space, same way. So not much different than residential. If you guys were looking at a two bedroom apartment in Norwood, you would very easily be able to find comps and know within a $50 range what a renovated apartment would go for. So it's similar in commercial, but the range might be a little bit different and there might be other factors. You might have to give tenants some uh, tenant improvement money where they can improve their space. Uh, you may have to get creative with the leases where if a tenant signs a five-year lease, maybe it's six months free, but you make it up on the back end. So there's a lot more room to get creative and make deals work. You would never do that with a residential tenant. Six months free and just pay me the second six months, make it up in the back half. Yeah, right. But commercial tenants, uh, the leases are personally guaranteed for the most part, or they're corporate guaranteed. So if a commercial tenant breaks a lease, they're still obligated to pay Commercial tenant breaks the lease, they're still obligated to pay. What? Uh, how do personal guarantees and corporate guarantees play into that? So a personal guarantee, I had a tenant who defaulted on a 10-year lease in year two, and they had a personal guarantee. So theoretically, I could have taken them to court and gotten three, four $400,000 judgment against them. But if the business owner is leaving your space, their business obviously failed. So you're not going to go after them and try to ruin their life. What you try to do is work out a win-win exit where they help you find the next tenant. They continue to pay until a tenant comes in or there is a lease breakage fee where, you know, I put so much money into it. I banked on them being there for 10 years. Now there's a significant cost to break that. With a corporate guarantee, there's no breaking it. So if you have a Starbucks in your shopping center, it's a corporate back lease. The only way they can break that 
is if the corporation files for bankruptcy. Now, a lot of people thought that those were the safest investments out there until COVID hit. So if you look at all the closed JC pennies, all the big box closures, and all the bankruptcies that retailers have filed, there goes your 10-year lease. So you could have had a property that was worth $6 million. When JCPenney declares bankruptcy, it could be worth less than two because now you have a giant big box to fill and it's, there's not many tenants taking down 60,000 square feet. So people think that triple net corporate back leases are the way to go. The returns are quite lower and the the potential for them going out of business is there. It's not a guarantee. You just um, dropped one of the buzzwords in commercial real estate. Uh, tr you said triple net. Can you explain for us what triple net means? Yes. So by definition, triple net is where the tenant pays all of the expenses, including taxes, insurance, maintenance, roof, exterior, parking lot. Triple nets are popular with people that want to park money or out-of-state investors. So if I wanted to buy a Starbucks in New York City, I can just look at the lease, never show up on site, never care what the property looks like, and you're essentially buying the paper because you're never getting a phone call. If you buy a McDonald's, a Wendy's, they're all triple net leases, Walgreens. You're essentially, again, just buying paper and you're getting your mailbox money every month, no problems until the 10 year lease comes up for renewal. And then you have to renegotiate unless there's renewals built into the lease where uh, Starbucks recently, uh, has, they've been pulling a fast one. So they'll sign a 10 year lease with a built in renewal. And when that 10 years is up, they'll threaten the landlord with going next door half a block away, two blocks away, unless they renew at a lower rate. So there's a lot of games being played currently with triple net leases. And people think that it's, it's a safe, easy investment. The returns are much lower. So a Starbucks at Chipotle, their triple net leases are often in the mid fours, 4.5% 4 cap rate. So your returns unless you get your financing at great terms are minimal. The appreciation is what some people bank on, but personally, I think you're better off with modified triple net, modified gross leases. So there's also triple net leases where um, the tenants uh, are responsible for everything, but the landlord is a point of contact. So if the parking lot needs to be resurfaced, the landlord has to take care of it they'll get reimbursed at the end of the year. Same thing with the roof, exterior, interior issues. Uh, landlords would have to take care of it. So they're still actively managing it, even though they're being reimbursed. And those are still considered triple net leases. Ash, let me, uh, I have some friends who did something similar when they got into retirement. Married couple, they were both working in real estate. When they decided it was time to retire, they pulled all of their money out of their IRAs, 401ks, what have you, and they built uh, a class A 100,000 square foot office and retail complex. I don't remember how long ago, but the idea was that the cash flow from that was going to way outperform anything that a mutual fund was going to give them. Now, they have a management company specific to the management of that property they handle the management company manages uh, full service uh, handles all of the utilities taxes and insurance and then bills all of that pro rate directly back to the office and retail tenants so the tenants are the ones who are actually paying directly for the management of the property is that is that triple net? Is that what you're talking about with a modified triple net lease? No, that's true triple net, but the landlord has some responsibilities, right? Whether it's a management company or professionally managed, but the management company would still get reimbursed for their time and effort for their fees. But let's talk about that. So let's say you buy a $5 million Walgreens. 
with a fresh 10 year lease. It's going to be so $5 million, 10 years to go. As the years go by, the value of that property diminishes because of the lease. So everybody wants to buy the fresh 10 year leases. When there's five years left on the lease, they're a little bit more anxious. When there's two years left on the lease, they're really anxious and they're not willing to pay the same $5 million because if Walgreens goes dark, that property is now worth $2 million. Does that make sense? So if, they don't, if, the, if those corporate back leases don't get renewed, you're essentially left with the value of the dirt in the building. Gotcha. Or like you were saying, you're left with the hustle of finding a new tenant who will sign a 10-year lease so that you can sell it at that. You are, uh, but if if a, if a if a corporate back tenant, a national tenant leaves, there's often a reason, and that property may not be as attractive. That makes sense. What is you? It sounds like you prefer properties that are not triple net, and you said cap rates are lower and people who do triple net are banking on appreciation or they just want mail. You didn't say mailbox money, but I think you intended. Oh, I, did. Mailbox I did. Everybody money. wants the mailbox money. Yeah. So tell me more about the difference between uh, the properties that are not triple net quantifiably, what kind of cap rate are you looking at uh, and what kind of responsibilities are you looking at as the landlord? Okay. Great question. So, you know, several years ago, I thought, the epitome was getting a class A shopping center with corporate national tenants. You really don't have any management headaches and everything's good. But in the last year, we've seen that there's a lot of risk to those properties as well. And the returns are significantly lower than mom and pop shopping centers. So a shopping center in a neighborhood that's not class A, it may have one or two national or regional tenants um, a subway, uh, a regional optometrist, doctor's office, something like that, uh, maybe with some vacancies. So typically, I would buy those at a 10 cap with the vacancies there that would help improve the cap rate. So uh, recently, $380,000 was what I paid for the strip mall in Owensville. It has three paying tenants and... Uh, one vacancy. So that was bought at a 30% cash on cash return as is. And if I can fill the last vacancy, it's 50, 60% return. So these returns on mom and pop strip malls are much higher because the guys from New York and California are not coming in and buying them. The number of investors that play in that sandbox is so low compared to residential multifamily and triple nets. So it's a niche that usually requires boots on the ground. So you're not getting out of state investors. The loans are a little bit more difficult to come by. Big banks especially do not want to finance anything with vacancies, commercial buildings with vacancies. Um, and often you start out by putting 30% down. And as you prove yourself and build relationships with lenders, you can get it down to 20%, which improves your cash on cash return. But I'm going to keep going. So one of my goals here is to get you residential guys out there to look into commercial. And Slocum, all you guys in the audience that have known me for years know that I've been preaching this for years. You guys have incredible systems in place. You know, uh, you guys send out mailers, put up signs everywhere. You buy lists of people who maybe live out of state or are behind on their mortgage or taxes. I've never once gotten a mailer about a commercial property. I've never had one of those calls that said, Hey, if you're looking to sell, I'll make you a fair cash offer. So if you guys that have all these systems in place, have the virtual assistants, have the acquisition managers, the dispo managers, would apply some of that team, some of that force, some of the hustle towards commercial, I think you would see the returns are well worth it. So buying, you know, the wholesalers out there, um, wholesaling 50, 60, $70,000 properties. Why isn't anybody wholesaling commercial properties? I've never received 
an email saying, hey, I'm a wholesaler. You want to get on my commercial list? I've received tons of calls and emails from people saying, hey, I've got this property in Cincinnati or Mount Lookout. Do you want to get on my buyer's list? And I tell them I only do commercial. And then that's the end of it. So um, my goal is to motivate somebody tonight to get into commercial real estate. And so I'm going to keep going. The barriers to entry, right? It's always, yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything about commercial. Um, too difficult. Not for me. Well, buy a commercial mixed- takes a lot of money. I don't have yes. enough money. Oh, for yeah. Commercial. Great. And Great. I need, I have to have some sort of track record in order to be borrowable. No bank is going to give me money to buy a strip mall. Okay. And so, yes, I don't know yeah, anything uh, about commercial. Go for it. Gosh. Yeah. So, uh, why not a mixed use building? There's so many of them, especially now, because mixed use buildings are typically owned by the casual investor. And because of COVID, they may have a vacancy or two and they can't handle it and they're selling them. There's so many of them up for sale right now. And a lot of them will go for one hundred and fifty to $250,000. So <clears throat> there's apartments above a storefront typically. And what happens is when the storefront goes vacant, people panic. Excuse me. And the apartments are still paying rents. The demand is still there for the apartments. Uh, and often you can go in and renovate the apartments and increase your revenue. But the challenge that people can't seem to get beyond is how do I rent the storefront? Well, you go knocking on doors. Every storefront in a half mile radius, bring them a flyer. Let them know that you have this vacancy. You'll make them a great deal. You'll lower their rent, whatever it takes. And if they don't know anybody, find out if they have a friend or another business that is looking for a commercial space. It's just pounding the pavement, Facebook, Marketplace, Craigslist. It's not terribly difficult to fill commercial vacancies. Tell us a little more about the mixed-use properties that you own, Osh. Uh, I don't think I own any currently. Um, I am not a big fan of those because of the residential part of it. So I take that back. I, I do I, I do own a couple, but they're managed by partners. Gotcha. So I'll manage the commercial space, but whoever I'm working with will manage the residential. I truly want nothing to do with residential real estate ever again. Going back to... I want to discuss barriers to entry further, but some uh, some things that you uh, that you pointed out earlier in apartments, uh, in residential investing, and when I say residential, I mean everything uh, that that people sleep in at night. So Airbnbs, single families, flips and rentals, apartments, etc. We are. We're, of course, accustomed to saying, you know, A, B, C, D, or F class area or property. It sounds like, well, I, I know similar similar terminology is used in the commercial space. Uh, I think any apartment investor would say, yes, the cash flow is better in C areas than A areas. And you're saying the same thing about commercial? Absolutely. Uh, but really, the difference is with commercial you can significantly improve the value of the property based on who's leasing it. So if you look at a lot of class C areas, you'll find family dollars, dollar generals. Well, quite often they buy a piece of land that's worth thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. They put up a block building, metal roof, and they then sell them anywhere from 700 to $2 million dollars because of the lease that they're signing. So if you own that land and capture a dollar general, you took a almost worthless piece of land and because of the lease that you have in place, you've now improved the property significantly. So same thing with the strip malls or the mixed use building. If you can find a great tenant, either personal guarantee, ideally a corporate guarantee the value of that property just went through the roof because investors are buying on the same cap rate, NOI, same numbers. Does that make sense? 
It does. Yeah, that would create a huge swing in value, wouldn't it? Huge. And if you look at the the way you can improve residential properties. So I had a friend of mine who was going to renovate his kitchen. And um, I asked him what he thought it would do for the value of his house. And he said, no matter how much money we put into our kitchen, my house will always be worth plus minus $10,000 from the last house that sold in this neighborhood. So residential is based on comps. Commercial is based on NOI and the strength of the commercial leases. And how much life those leases have left, it sounds. Correct. Gotcha. We just, uh, we're getting inundated with questions. I'm just getting through them, getting them set up. There, there are a couple more baseline questions I want to ask Ash uh, to get uh, a, a better, more solid understanding of what it is that he does and some, uh, some more generic questions. Please do keep asking yours, though. If you are watching through Facebook Live, which five people are currently, I encourage you to click the Zoom link. Join us over on Zoom. You can get your questions answered as well. Tell, tell me more about how you secure financing for something like a small strip mall and how much, and how much more difficult it is when there's serious vacancy. Great question. So recently I had a couple of big banks call me and ask if they can take over refinancing everything I own. And I thought, great, if I can lower my interest rate, save a lot of money, it would be ideal. Well, when they found out that some of my properties have vacancies or they don't have long-term leases in place, they wanted nothing to do with those. They wanted to cherry pick the ones that have been stabilized. So big banks are not the answer. It's always your local lenders. Typically, I like suggesting banks that have three locations or less. The reason for that is you get to know the people that are making the decisions. You get to know the president. You get to know everybody there, and they don't change often. So I've been banking with the same bank for 13 years, and none of the people have changed. So initially, when you don't have a track record, you're putting down 30%. Once the building's stabilized, you can do the same cash out refi, over time, once you've proven yourself and built that relationship with the lender, you can get it down to 20%, even on vacant buildings. So worst case for a lot of people starting out, just underwrite the property at 30% down. So I'm a newbie in, uh, I'm new to commercial investing. I, uh, I'm getting super excited hearing what you're saying, Ash. I, want, I really want to find a better return than what I'm seeing with the apartments, single families that I'm doing. Okay, cool. Little strip mall, five, six, whatever, mom and pop size. What, um, what kind of purchase price uh, am I likely looking at? How much money do I have? Do I need to save in order to have that 30% plus closing costs? So I'm going to answer that question a different way. How do you Great. find those deals? So the biggest secret for me is look at the residential MLS for commercial properties. Most of my deals have come from that. So you have a residential realtor who's often doing a favor for a friend and listing a commercial property. And quite often those are mispriced because residential realtors will base a price on comps versus commercial cap rates. So all you guys get on your residential MLS sites and filter the results by commercial and start looking there. And then I don't know that there, there's probably not a whole lot of fully vacant uh, strip malls or commercial properties out there right now because the economy has been well for the last several years. So ideally, look for one that's partially occupied or, again, a mixed use with apartments above. And there's, there's plenty of them out there, but underwrite it that way and base your commercial income on a very conservative number. 
What is that conservative number? Well, when you say conservative, what would make a number conservative? So for office, sorry, for um, warehouse, industrial, I would look at $4 a square foot. So if it's a thousand square feet, multiply it by four, divided by 12. So $4,000 annually. So a thousand square feet, when they say $4 a square foot, it's a thousand times four is your annual revenue and then divide it by 12. So 300 something a month is what you're getting. Office rents will go for eight to $10 a square foot. Retail will go from 10 to $18 a square foot. And again, you can look at comps very easily and see what other vacancies are going for per square foot. Did I lose you on that? Does that make sense? It does, yeah. Okay. The what are your thoughts on single tenant spaces? You've you've name dropped uh Starbucks, uh names like Walgreens, Family Dollar, Dollar General are jumping around in the comments and the questions. What are your thoughts on a single tenant space? So they're great if you buy them with a lease in place. They're low cap rates. The returns are very low. Often the financing that's put in place for those is interest only. And that's the only way some of these people can make money when they're buying at a four cap. So they're, they're, they're banking on the cash flow. They may bank on some appreciation, but they're, you're not killing it by buying those places, you're parking money. And you can, you guys can do the math, get on LoopNet, find a Starbucks, find a Chipotle, find um, McDonald's and do the math. So pretend you're getting a 20% down loan and let's say 3.5% interest on that. And you're just about breaking even. Now do the same numbers with an interest only loan and you're making your 15% or so cash on cash returns. So that's how those people are making money. But 15, 20% is not what you should aim for. 15, 20% is not what you should aim for. I know a handful of apartment investors who are listening to this, who are probably wetting themselves hearing you say that. Well then put your money with Joe Fairless because he'll, he'll return 18 to 20%. Passively, no phone calls, just to check every month. Yeah, that's that's a, a solid point. That's really good stuff. So, so that's why you know I, I don't mean to um, get on you about your returns, but my benchmark is twenty percent. Because if I can get that with Joe and Ashcroft, I'm not going to put in my own time and effort into getting a return that's lower than twenty percent. Now, is that your? Are you talking about cash on cash? Are you talking about uh, internal rate of return factoring in the sale of the property after an exit? It's strictly annualized cash on cash without the exit and without appreciation. So that's straight cash flow. Awesome. Is it, we had, we had a question from Charmony earlier. Is it, is it good to have a job to qualify for loans for commercial property? Typically, uh, unless you have a relationship with a banker, a local lender, um, they like to see employment, but we don't have the same rules as FHA loans and Fannie and Freddie loans. Um, it's strictly based on your relationship with a lender. So if you have the balance sheet, great. If not, partner with somebody who has a job, has a relationship, or has the balance sheet. So there's not the typical check boxes with commercial loans that there are for residential loans. And commercial loans don't get sold as often as residential loans do. A lot of banks will keep commercial loans on their books. So yes, it does matter, especially when you're new but keep in mind that there are um, fewer guidelines, regulations, and requirements because these um, 
because these loans are, are typically portfolio. So a bank gets to decide for themselves who they're going to lend to. Correct. We have a question here from Arthur. What is your criteria for commercial when it comes to occupancy, square footage, number of tenants, and the type of tenants, uh, age of the leases, age of the buildings? What, are you, what do you focus on? I have no criteria whatsoever. So I'll look at um, every property that comes online several times a day in about 10 different counties, and I scroll through them very quickly. Uh, if something catches my eye, I'll dive in a little deeper, but I'll look at anything, warehouse, industrial, medical, office, shopping centers. Gotcha. And you just gave us your, your, your benchmark cash on cash return as well. What, uh, another question, this one's from Todd. Do you have any insight in, on having the, the government as your tenant. He's thinking about a strip mall where uh, one of the units is rented by the local post office. Now, I've heard about those. Um, often, uh, government leases are short. I almost uh, bought a building that John Boehner was in, and his lease said if he doesn't get reelected, he gets to exit out of his lease. Um, I know there's a whole niche for post offices, um, BMVs, that kind of stuff. I don't know much about that. Gotcha. I would imagine that those leases that they, that, well, I mean, trying to imagine what the, what the government finds favorable that, that changes, you know, every election cycle, but I would think that they would favor long-term stable leases. I don't know that I've ever in my life seen a post office or a BMV move. You know what please, they would do? Please it, comment if you if you're more familiar with this than I am or Ash is. They would probably put in renewals that they can exercise, not the landlord. So they can stay there for up to ten years, fifteen years, and they have the option every year of staying, but you don't have the option of kicking them out. That makes that makes sense. What um you have talked about prioritizing cash on cash and not basing your numbers on an exit. When you underwrite, is there a particular hold period that you're looking at? No, um, I made the mistake in 2015. I thought the economy was at a peak and I started selling properties. And I was definitely wrong about that because for five more years, the economy kept going up. Um, so I don't know when to sell. Uh, my Every time I buy a property, my intention is to hold it forever and then something comes around or, um, you know, if the economy uh, is great and you have all these, excuse me, coastal buyers coming in and overpaying for property like they were doing the last several years, I would sell. But I don't base my decisions on exit plans. I partnered with a guy one time and, excuse me, um, his question was, what's the exit plan? And I said, there is none. You just make this work. I mean, I don't know. I don't know the right answer to that. Just, I love that answer, though. Yeah. It's just hustle. Um, it was a vacant office building that we bought. And literally, no exit plan. I didn't know how to answer that question. Just make it work. This is particularly relevant to me. This is my question, Ash. Targeted hold period is forever. I'll sell when someone will pay me too much money. I 100% understand that sentiment. Does it change the way that you look at loan products? Are you looking for the longest term, longest amortization possible? Or because you know someone who's someone who's thinking about a five year hold period doesn't care about the difference between a five and 10 year term and what it does to their interest rate. Are you personally going for like the longest term you can get at the lowest interest rate? Is that your only focus with the financing? Typically it is. Um, commercial rates are often set for five years and they're amortized over 20 or 25. Again, if you have that relationship. So you, you can only lock a rate for about five years. They won't do longer locks. 
I'm working on an apartment deal right now with a 10-year term and a 30-year AM. So I have found one thing about residential investing that may, may be a little better than what Ash is talking about. One so is that, is that typical for residential, multi that is, um That is a government-backed small balance loan, either Fannie or Freddie. Uh, loan amounts between a million and six million. Okay. Um, it's, I'll tell you, it makes a serious impact on my cash on cash returns to the point that the deal would not have made uh, nearly as much sense if we were on a 2025 year AM or a five year term. We also, um, another projection for us with our apartment investing is that we, uh, all of the big names in apartments. Uh, the commercial brokers and, you know, even people like Gary Keller are predicting uh, a recession coming specifically to apartments. And so is uh, Harvard business. And and so we want to know that our financing, our, our financing is not necessarily recession proof, but if there is something coming in the next few years that we're not trying to renegotiate uh, the terms of a mortgage or a refinance, we want to make sure that the term we have with the really juicy low interest rate right now will ride out whatever's coming in the next few years. Got it. You know, and to that, I know a lot of people see this retail apocalypse that's going on right now and it scares them away from doing commercial, but that lends more credibility to the neighborhood shopping centers, the neighborhood office buildings. Those are not impacted the way that congested class A shopping centers are. So those neighborhoods still need their services, the dog grooming, the insurance, the mom and pop diner. Those are still stable, easy to find. Um, you definitely do not want to buy a class A strip mall right now because there's a tremendous amount of supply. So don't let that scare you. Awesome. What... Um... Specific to Cincinnati, are there any parts of town that you're focused on? No, I've done everything from the west side, east side. Um, no. So you're not, uh, even though your targeted hold period is forever, you're not doing a lot of projecting, trying to figure out what areas are going to appreciate more than others? Um, no, because I've never been able to get the jump on that. Uh, I know Northern Kentucky is hot right now, certain areas, but the prices already reflect that. Um, I think it's just you getting lucky. So I, I got some uh, properties in downtown Milford before it started booming, and that was just luck, right? But um, no, uh, do you residential guys do that? Oh, 100%. Okay. Absolutely, all the time. We're always thinking about what's hot and what's coming next. Well, then tell me where those hot areas are. <laughs> the um, the biggest answer that's not just an elevator pitch would be that um, people are trending towards prioritizing proximity over size. And uh, you, you could say that COVID is pushing back on this a little bit, but now that all of our entertainment fits in our pocket, we don't need as much space as we used to. And we find a hot, we, we, we societally, the middle class and up place a higher priority on uh, proximity to work and entertainment, having to spend less time in the car, making it easier to go out, maybe even walk out to a restaurant bar and then get home. Uh, specific to Cincinnati, we also have a, uh, a very high density of white collar employment in the urban core specifically. Uh, and there are some neighborhoods that are uh, either still in the throes of gentrification or are experiencing the early, um, the early trends that lead to gentrification that are close to those employers and close to that entertainment. I'll leave it at that. I mean, the, the urban core is seeing a lot of revitalization right now. So let me revise my answer a little bit. Um, I've purchased a few buildings in Norwood because it's an up and coming area, but it's already up and coming by the time I got in. But it makes me feel better about certain areas. Uh, how small of a commercial property is too small for you, Osh? Um, I've done two tenant 
retail where it's um, 3,000 square feet. I don't think it matters as long as the numbers work. Are there any areas or of Cincinnati or property types that you would recommend to someone who's new in commercial investing? Yes, obviously something small, easily managed. Um, the mixed use buildings I think are great because again, it's a great transition from residential to commercial. You still have the safety net of the apartments, but now you have the exposure to commercial with whatever commercial space you have. I'm thinking about an office hack. Um, and, and mixed use sounds really intriguing because I know apartments. Yes, they're, they're higher hassle, but like you said, I'm, I've got the systems in place now. Uh, and I still live in a house hack where I have where I don't have to pay a rent and my tenants are paying the mortgage. Um, an office hack where I can do the same thing for my workspace and, and my employees. That seems really intriguing. So I have um, suburban office space and it's hot right now. People yeah. are just wanting to get out of their house. Literally the last three tenants that came in were working from home since March and either their dogs bothering them, their kids are bothering them. They just have to get out of their house and they're renting office space for that. Yeah. So, you, you know, you don't want class A office space in a high rise. You want something close to home where you can drive a few minutes, have your own secluded office. So if you can find office space, those are hot right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm one of those people. I got a toddler at home. Uh, and, Yes, I've got a toddler at home. I'll leave it at that. And yeah, uh, yeah. I needed, man, COVID hit and all of a sudden everyone's quarantined, shelter in place. I needed a place to get out. I'm grateful that I had um, a, a good, reasonable office situation where I could go be self-isolated, but also not uh, at home in the heat of all of that. Where are you now? At this present moment, I'm actually uh, in one of my clients office hacks, I found him an office condo in downtown Cincinnati off market. And he, um, instead of paying me a commission or a finder's fee, he offered me free rent for life in this room right here. Very cool. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's nice free rent, uh, free rent. It's, it's close to home. It's, there are nice things to do downtown. I'm not making any money off of it though. I'm jealous that I let him buy it without me. What's um, one more question then I want to get into maybe a couple of scenarios. Ash, what given, given the shifts that we're seeing in or the potential shifts we're seeing in the commercial rental landscape now with COVID, you've mentioned big box stores. Um, the way that we use office space is changing. What's What's still recession proof? I still think the suburban properties, um, you don't want to go close to a mall where there's a ton of retail because there could be a ton of vacancies happen at any moment as well. But in those landlocked suburban areas where you can't build additional properties, um, office buildings, retail, those are not going anywhere because people aren't going to move away from the suburbs. If anything, they're going back to suburban sprawl. So I would avoid uh, everything with the glitter on it. Buy the properties that are in neighborhood locations, and you'd be surprised at what kind of returns they provide. I hope everyone heard you over the sound of me banging everything you just said into my keyboard. Uh, cause that was gold right there. If you weren't taking notes, you missed out. That's really helpful to hear. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, and you know, so that was an epiphany for me too, right? Cause up until recently, I always thought having that class A strip mall was when you made it. Well, the returns on a $1.5 million class A strip mall are often not as good as a half million dollar suburban strip mall. And the biggest reason is that there's a, such a few players in that market, right? So all of you guys that are listening to this, there's no reason you guys shouldn't be listening or looking for those properties as well. 
because the guys from New York and California are not buying them. They're buying all the class A's, but they're not going into the suburbs. How do you, I've made some assumptions and asked you questions based on my assumptions, but how do you see the commercial rental landscape shifting? Uh, avoid malls, areas with major retail because they're more likely to be volatile right now, but what else? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't have much to say other than those suburban markets are the way to go. Um, think about what we do and where we go. So where are you guys going to dine for your services, the dog groomers? Um, where do you shop now? Right? So kind of focus on some of your own habits and let that steer you towards making your investment decisions. I'll tell you, I am going to local mom and pop restaurants and places yeah. that are close to my neighborhood that you would probably consider C class and not, not in major retail areas. And in particular, because it's convenient. Um, the delivery is fast to where I live because I'm in a local neighborhood. Uh, and I want to support local business. And I know if we're dining out, um, the person who owns Tickle Pickle, the burger place in Northside, you sure that's a uh, restaurant? Tickle Pickle is a restaurant <laughs> for the record, and they have delicious burgers and milkshakes that are all named after uh, hard rock bands. The best milkshake is Oreo Speedwagon, and the best burger is the Metallica. You heard Where it. Where is that? It, Tickle Pickle is in Northside on Hamilton. Oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah, I had that on for dinner on Friday. Uh, but I also, uh, thinking about my – uh, retail and restaurant dollars. I'm thinking I'm, I want to support somebody local. I'd much rather my money go to the local place with the uh, comical name than to Wendy's or McDonald's. So I'm, I'm telling you that I'm shopping. I'm moving my retail dollars to exactly the places that Osh is telling you that you should be looking at buying. Yeah. So great answer to your question. How do you manage vacancies um, or the lease up on a value add property? Great question. So there was one time that I used a commercial broker and it was a 12,000 square foot uh, retail building, single tenant that um, came up. The tenant defaulted on his lease after three years into a five year lease. And I got lazy and thought, hey, why don't I just farm this out and somebody else can pound the pavement and do all the legwork. And I hired who I thought was one of the best commercial brokers in the city. And they had the property for six months, had very little action on it. I did not renew their contract. And within one month of me having that property back, I had it sold. And the way I sold it was I put it on Craigslist in every town in Ohio, Illinois, Michigan, Kentucky, Pennsylvania. And, you know, it took me um, a couple hours to copy and paste a single Craigslist ad to every Craigslist city that they have. And once a week or however often you renew those ads and a guy from Detroit saw the listing, came down and bought it. So, it's pounding the pavement using Facebook, Craigslist, networking. I've often uh, paid uh, re referral fees if somebody could find me a tenant. You've probably seen those on Facebook. If somebody can find me a tenant for a specific space, I'll pay X number of dollars. And those posts get shared and you just get a, a lot more eyes on your property than by listing it with a broker. So if you do have vacancy, don't make the mistake I did. Put the hustle in yourself and get it rented. Hand out flyers, right? Uh, make up flyers. Uh, walk around to all the neighboring businesses. Hand them out. Introduce yourself. Follow up. And let the brokers know, too, that you'll pay them a commission. Excuse me. If they can find you a tenant. So you're better off doing it yourself. 
That's awesome. And you had said that, that you, you beat pavement you, or you have beat pavement to find tenants. That makes sense. And paying referral fees. Absolutely. Do you, have you focused on building a network of commercial brokers for bringing you deals and for bringing you tenants? Has that been a focus of yours? Um, so yes, um, I have done that, but typically brokers will send deals to people who have purchased from them in the past. So, um, the more you buy from different brokers, the more you're at the top of their list. Um, often if a broker calls you for a property and you pass on it, it kind of moves you down the list. So it's hit or miss. Uh, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to convince people to look into commercial on the investing side for a lot of you realtors, you ought to look into commercial, uh, brokerages as well. And I'll give you an example. So the property that I had that the broker had for six months, um, I had to pay $1,200 for their sign. So they put a giant sign that was custom made on my property it had no mention of the address, of the details of the property. It was just a giant sign with their name on it and their phone number. Then they came back to me and said, hey, we have to do a broker open house and we have to incentivize brokers to come to the open house. And I said, how do you do that? And he said, well, we have to have a catered lunch, but it's got to be a really nice lunch. It can't be run of the mill. And then we have to give them a door prize so in this case, the door prize was a $100 Visa gift card. So every broker that would walk through that door gets a $100 Visa gift card. It gets better. He said, then we have to incentivize them to sell the property. So it was a half million dollar building. Not only do they get their commission, but I have to bump it up. So it was then a vacation anywhere in the world that they wanted to go to up to $5,000. So I would pay a travel agent five grand and they would get that in addition to their commission. Now it gets better than that. The brokers then come back to me and say, hey, so we have to buy a list of expiring leases. And I forgot how many thousands of dollars that was. So these guys are out no money. And they're, you know, the, the commercial tenant or the me is the one paying all these fees. Can you imagine that in residential real estate? where you would go and say, hey, I need to buy a list of high net worth buyers. I need you to pay for my sign. So being a commercial broker seems to have its perks. Yeah, I'm glad I registered with Keller Williams Commercial. Good. <laughs> I need to get invited to those open houses. I need a list of brokers who do, who, who, who do those things. You know, so uh, initially I said, can we give them a Fitbit? He's like, we have so many of them because everybody hands out a Fitbit. And here's, here, here's the best part. So we scheduled the uh, broker open house. We had the caterers. We had the Visa gift cards purchased. And the day before, the broker calls and says, hey, no one's going to come because there's a downtown office building that's offering. And I forgot what the purchase And they are. have a $200 Visa Yeah, gift it was card. something silly. But um, yeah, what a joke. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, if I if I went to one of my single family owner occupied listings and said things like that, they would say, "Oh, well, I'll just sign with one of the other twenty real estate agents who have sent me postcards or or called me or knocked them, you know, who, who've looked for my business." Yeah, so I've got a great story um, that touches on uh, if I employ commercial brokers. Um, so I had, I, I came across a residential realtor who was just an absolute savage. And this lady was building a team just rising quickly. So I had the same conversation with her. I said, Hey, why don't you look into commercial? And she said, you know, I don't know anything about it. Like I give all my commercial deals to this one guy. And I'm like, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. So I offered to walk her through the next commercial deal that she got. And in doing so, I've landed the Owensville strip mall from her. But it was me trying to convince people to try to go into commercial real estate. Because again, it's a much smaller sandbox, a lot more lucrative. 
And that was a bit of networking that where I was trying to help somebody that paid off. Right. Yeah. You, you paint a picture of filling commercial vacancies, either being difficult or requiring a lot more work, depending on how you, um, d depending on, on your perspective, how long do your vacancies typically last? How long is it between the end of a lease and the, the beginning of a new one? It varies based on the space. If it's just a white box storefront, you can fill it easily. I've got one location now that's a bank. It's, you, could wa you walk into it and it looks like an operating bank with the teller windows, the little suction thing in the drive-through. Um, that one's going to be difficult because right now bank lobbies aren't even open, right? Right, yeah. So, um, yeah, that one's probably going to be a long time, but that's okay. That was all built into the pro forma. Uh, but the, you know, it does take longer and it is harder to fill a commercial vacancy, but often those tenants stay a lot longer than residential tenants. So, and it, once they leave the, the amount of, uh, fix up required is minimal. So they often leave it in the same space at the same condition that they got it in, if not better. So, you know, imagine, uh, I've gotten phone calls where, Commercial tenants have asked if they can renovate their bathroom. Like when would you ever find a residential tenant wanting to renovate their bathroom, right? So you can give a commercial tenant a white box space and they will often improve it on their own dime, which is another beauty of commercial real estate. You said big vacancy on a bank or bank looking building was cooked into your pro forma. How do you underwrite for vacancy on those properties? The previous uh, tenant was paying $3,500 a month. It was, I think, People's Bank. So I thought if I can get $1,500 per month out of that space, it would be like a 60% cash on cash return. So just conservatively underwrite it. Do, so did you underwrite a period of vacancy or did you just underwrite a much lower rent to compensate for vacancy? There was no period because the existing tenants return a 30% cash on cash return. So I don't care how long it goes. Obviously, love to get a tenant in there, but it's not hurting. It's gotcha. not costing money. And it's hard. It's so it's it's almost impossible to figure out how long a vacancy is going to last. You can look at average days on the market for a commercial property, but each space is unique, and it's hard to gauge that. So, what if if. If I want to do some more research, I'm, I'm really intrigued, gosh, I want to do some more research about commercial properties, though. Are there any resources or studying resources that you recommend when it comes to books, YouTube, podcasts? I would spend uh, your time on bigger pockets. So you can post the numbers of a deal on bigger pockets and, and get some great responses. I have not seen any good commercial real estate books. There's some YouTube videos out there, but there's a lot of bad ones. So that's a generally a waste of time unless you know what you're looking for specifically. Uh, Bigger Pockets is great. So get your uh, commercial property that you think is a win, get the numbers on it, post it on there, and be descriptive about what type of space it is, and you'll get a lot of good thinking points. That's awesome. How do you, Osh, how do you properly discount the valuation of a property with um, in, in major leases that are ending soon? You have to anticipate that that lease will not be renewed. You can never bank on these guys magically renewing the lease. You can often work into your due diligence that you negotiate a lease renewal. 
So I've done that where if uh, two or three leases are coming up uh, within a year, in my due diligence, I'll put down that I get to renegotiate and re-up the leases. So if I can't get them to re-sign, I can back out of the deal. But if, if something's two years away, um, you may have to incentivize the people to re-up their lease. So that incentive could be, hey, I won't raise your rent if you sign a new five-year lease. And that's often a great incentive. Oh, okay. What, um, so you, all right. So you assume that leases are going to end. Uh, let's say two years out, you assume that, um, okay. Let's say it's a strip mall. It has eight units. Uh, four of the units have leases ending uh, between 18 months and three years from now. How does that impact what you're willing to pay for the property? Um, you have to, again, anticipate the leases not being renewed. How easily can you get a new tenant in there? So if it's a restaurant that's leaving, probably pretty easy to get a new restaurant operator in there. If it's a hair salon, same thing. If it's a very unique type of tenant where their space is built out specifically for them, like a bank that I'm sitting on, right? Um, that's tough. So you have to anticipate that staying vacant for quite some time, or you have to anticipate a remodel or back to a white box. One of the things you have to watch out for as well is if a lot of leases are expiring close together, you never want tenant after tenant leaving because vacant buildings are so much harder to fill than have vacant buildings. There's momentum. So if you take an office building, uh, nobody wants to be the first or second tenant in, but once you start filling it, that momentum carries and people see new life being brought into a space. So you anticipate all the what ifs. Is there a particular factor that you use? Is there a what if factor, a what if discount? I need to pay 30, 50% less because of the what ifs? Yes. And that comes into your underwriting where uh, there was a deal that looked great until I saw the real numbers. So the rents that I was presented with were not the rents that were in the leases. So... Mm -hmm. We had to renegotiate the purchase price, which we did, and got the deal done. Gotcha. You've you've used the term white box a few times. Uh, tell us what uh, what a white box or white boxing is. White box is typically drywall walls, either unfinished or plywood floors. Or finished floor, but just is a simple... A, is it a term used for making a space, a rental space, as generic as possible? It so is. So that it, is, it, tra it attracts the broadest uh, tenant pool? It's a blank canvas where somebody can see their business in there. And again, the great thing about commercial is if you give somebody a white box, they often will improve it on their dime. And then you, as a landlord, have a say as to what alterations they can make. You have a say of, if you make these alterations, when you leave, it has to be put back to a white box or you have to leave the new counter that you built. You have to leave your light fixtures. So each time a tenant leaves a commercial property, it should be better than when you gave it to them. Do you, okay, you have a, um, you have a space coming up for rent. Do you white box it before you market it for rent? Do you, if, if it's not going to be white boxed by the tenant, uh, like the bank, for example, do you incur the cost of getting it back to, uh, to generic neutral or do you go ahead and market it first? 
I think you roll the dice and try to market it first. If people come in and they cannot envision what the space could be, you may have to make some alterations, but ideally spend the least amount of money in doing that. That makes a lot of sense. And, and again, like, so the bank is a great example because, um, you know, I, I can't see a fish market looking at a bank with a teller area and thinking, yeah, this could work. Yeah. That's a, that's a fair point. I know personally a lot of the people who are on this uh, and I know that they are residential investors and I know uh, that we all have very similar guidelines when it comes to analyzing a deal. You mentioned, and I'm going to do this, uh, you mentioned going to the local residential MLS, put on the commercial filters, look at the commercial properties, see uh, it's probably a residential tenant doing a buddy a favor and they may be miss. They may not fully understand the potential of the property because it's outside of their wheelhouse and they're just doing a friend a favor. Uh, a lot of the people who are watching right now are using very similar numbers and very similar analytics when it comes to analyzing the properties they see on the MLS. Uh, you've got the 70% rule for management vacancy, um, maintenance and CapEx, the 50% rule for, you know, 50% of the gross rents minus your debt service should be your cash flow. What do you have any generic rules of thumb when you're looking at, at commercial properties like that? Just not the in-depth analysis, but uh, on the surface, it makes sense to dive into this property or not kind of analytics. Yes. It all comes down to cash on cash return. So what, I think, are, what is, yeah, what's your cheat sheet for figuring that out quickly? There is no cheat sheet because you have to look at the leases and figure out what the landlord is responsible for and what the tenants are responsible for. So with commercial, it's difficult to look at rent and look at purchase price and come up with a number because each lease is different. So often when you're underwriting a property, the first thing you do is ask the listing broker for the existing leases. Is, if, is the expectation of someone who has listed a commercial property that leases will be shared uh, to any, with any interested buyer? Uh, often you have to sign non-disclosures or you may have to send them your balance sheet or some bank credentials depending on the property. Gotcha. That's different in apartments. I, um, those, those leases are, are typically held in confidence much longer. Uh, on some of my listings, you, uh, the uh, buyers have to have an accepted contract before we'll show them the actual paper. That's rare in commercial real estate. Yeah, that makes sense because there are so many more variables in the commercial lease that are, uh, mandatory for, for people like you in figuring out what the, what, what can be paid for the property based on the terms of lease. So let's say I am, I'm an apartments guy, rentals, long-term. Um, I have my own lease. I self-manage. Okay. I'm, I'm about to, to close on, uh, a mixed use space or I've got some office and retail and I'm putting together my lease, Osh, uh, for this office and retail space. What are the things you think I need to have in my lease that I wouldn't think about coming from residential? Ooh. Okay. So How long, well, first question, uh, all of my residential leases are one year long with some sort of automatic renewal. How long should my commercial leases be and are renewals automatic? So renewals are, they benefit the tenant only with commercial. So if I have a tenant who is running a successful business and they have a three year lease, well, in the end, they've also improved their space. At the end of three years, I get to renegotiate their rent and I, I have the leverage because are they going to leave a space that they put a lot of money into, right? So that's 
that answers a longevity question. You want your leases to be relatively short to where the tenant is vested in your space. They've got clientele that are used to seeing them at that location. They've put money into the space. So now you've got them and not, not in a bad way. I mean, you know, you, you can raise their rents to a fair market value and they'd be happy to pay if their business is doing well. Um, you want your rent, you want your leases to be as close to triple net as possible. So you want um, any uh, windows breaking on the tenant, any HVAC plumbing issues on the tenant. Now, when you have a small mom and pop tenant, it's not realistic to think that they would spend ten, fifteen thousand dollars replacing their HVAC system. So you can modify it and say they're responsible for the first thousand dollars in repairs. They're responsible for the first five hundred dollars in plumbing issues. Because if it's you know a, a sole proprietor a salon, you're not going to give them a bill that's going to break their business. So something fair, but uh, ideally close to triple net as possible. What do you think about leases, like a five-year lease, um, where the rent already within the lease goes up each year? As long as the tenants are okay with it, that's ideal. So you definitely want to build in rent increases and renewals into the lease. So <clears throat> I, take that, I take that back. You want the rent increases built in. You want the renewals left out if at all possible. What if the, um, what if the renewal is automatically at a rent increase? If the tenants are smart, they will build in their renewals. Ideally, I mean, if I was renting a space, I would want four five-year renewals. So I could potentially be there for 20 years, and I know what the rent increase is going to be. In rare cases, you can build in a renewal, and the tenant will agree to pay market price. But that's a tough one. Is it ever a thing where um, when negotiating the renewal of a lease, a tenant is required to share their financials with the landlord? It is uh, typically with restaurants. You want them to share their financials or at least their sales numbers. That's specific to restaurants. Why is that? Uh, because they fluctuate often and restaurants are one of those businesses that just destroys people. It's when, when their restaurant business, when their sales go down, uh, they continue to sink money into it. They put their personal assets up, they drain their bank accounts, their 401k, and it just has a tendency to destroy people. So you want to see that downward trend before the apocalypse hits. And then you could work with the tenants and say, listen, let's redo your lease. And um, instead of paying me a flat rate, you pay me a percentage of your sales, right? Mm. You ideally want to keep Gross that- sales. Yeah, gross, net, ideally gross. But you want to keep that tenant in place for as long as you can because the turnover is expensive, just like residential. How do you evict a commercial tenant? Um, I don't think I ever have. I never have. I almost did once. You get a lawyer to send them a notice to vacate, and I think the process is similar to residential. But you so the can't, answer is you get a lawyer. Yeah, you get a lawyer. How much is the lawyer going to uh, charge you? Uh, whatever their hour, hourly rate is. There's not a lot of eviction lawyers for commercial. So use whoever your contract law attorney is. Gotcha. Uh, but now here's the thing. What, go ahead. You, you typically would not have to evict a commercial tenant. This is a business owner, right? And this is why I love doing commercial versus residential. I would much rather deal with business owners than class C tenants. I get that now that I have class C tenants for sure. Yeah, and I mean, this may sound crazy, but 
uh, once a quarter, I invite all the tenants that I have out to a happy hour, either at my house or somewhere. And it's a big networking party, right? But I've had all these people at my house, which you would never do with residential, right? I mean, these are people you want to be around, that you want to learn from, that you want to help succeed. Last, uh, just want to make a last call to all of our viewers. If you have questions that have not yet been asked, please get those asked now. Use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Ash, a question for you while people are, are, are writing in their, their last minute questions before we head out here. This has been really informational. We always end up going over time. Uh, we've had a run of great uh, guest speakers with really great things to say tell me i i wanted to um give you a couple of criteria and then tell you based on those criteria what would get you excited but let me put it this way you're looking at something like a small retail or strip center it is in the area you're interested in you like the suburbs you like it to be close to neighborhoods and not too not so close to major retail that it's dependent upon big box stores. You've found a space like that. You're starting to dig into the numbers and dig into the leases. What, what's going to get you excited about that property? So if at 50% occupancy, if you're paying all of your expenses, if you're paying all your expenses, at 50% occupancy. Correct. And obviously the condition of the roof, the condition of the parking lot, the big CapEx items. So here's what I told Joe I would do. I've been threatening to do this for a long time, but um, I'm going to record me going through commercial properties on the residential MLS and LoopNet and wherever else, and I'll dictate what my thought process is and how I evaluate each of these properties. So I'll do that in the next couple of days, and um, one of you guys can post it on the Best Ever Facebook group, and it'll kind of give you a glimpse as to how I look at and filter through commercial properties. Are you, are you telling me, Osh, that if I'm looking at properties like that and I get into the leases, I don't really fully know what I'm doing, but I see the leases, I figure out what the landlord's responsibilities are, I look at what's currently there, and I figure out I can cover all of my expenses as the landlord with 50% occupancy, that I should get excited and that should be something I consider moving forward with? Yes, and then post it on uh, bigger pockets so nobody steals your deal and get some great feedback. Should I go ahead and put an offer in on it, see what happens, get it locked up, get it in, get into due diligence and then start really digging away? Or should I, I start digging more heavily before I put the offer in? No, you have to secure the deal. Uh, first mover advantage is a real thing with commercial. A great example of this was back in, I think, 2014, uh, a, a strip mall on the west side got listed for $650,000. Um, it, it got listed on Friday night. So first thing Saturday morning, I called the listing broker. I stalked him until I got a hold of him. And um, we negotiated a $625,000 purchase price. By Monday morning, he had offers for $850,000 cash. Wow. So, and then, so, uh, you know, all these other guys waited for the weekend to end and they lost out on a deal. So that same property I sold, uh, I held it for one year. So I would pay capital gains tax, sold it for a million to a guy from New York. Two years later, he sold it for 1.6 million. Nothing changed. He never even stepped foot on the property. Wow. So yeah, first mover advantage, lock it up. You typically have 45 days of due diligence with commercial and you can do all your inspections, lease reviews, 
attendant interviews during that time? 45 days due diligence. Correct. That's yeah, that's much longer than I usually get. What do you, um, how much value do you put on the neighborhood a property is in call it B, C, D, uh, and how much value do you put on specific locations, like where it lies on the street? Is it street corner, et cetera? If there's leases in place, I don't put a whole lot of value into that. That strip mall on the west side was walking distance to the most shoplifted Walmart in the country. It was in Price Hill. I mean, that was, it was a pretty rough area, right? But again, the numbers dictate the value. There isn't a, a Walmart in Price Hill anymore, is there? Did it close on the west side? I don't think there's one in Price Hill. Oh, I think it's still, well, it's, it might be whatever town is next to Price Hill, Western Hills. Maybe. But again, so it's the numbers that dictate the value with commercial. Now, location, if these tenants were to leave, um, how easy would it be to re-tenant? This was in a pretty congested area not much retail vacancy. So I'm, I was confident that I could retenant the spaces. Awesome. Ash, really appreciate you taking the time to do this. We've had some 40 participants uh, come in and out. We've had some additional people on uh, the Ferguson Avenue Walmart. Gaston is familiar. There of course, you go. Gaston is familiar. Um, <laughs> and and Gaston says he definitely would not invite all his residential tenants to his house for any of you who know <laughs> Gaston that is hilarious uh, Ash really appreciate you taking the time this uh, this event as a Facebook live event is uh, is now and will be as a recording in the Facebook group this is an a best ever real estate investor mastermind if you're not in that group yet you will get invited to it soon because you're either here because you're already in that group and you got my link or because you registered with your email address and you will be invited to that Facebook group uh, this uh ash for those who are uh, interested in following up with you could you please comment the contact information you want to share on this facebook live event in the facebook group and then they can get your email or whatever from there i will one last one last point of a clarification because we got a couple questions in at the very last minute uh, what is Ash's favorite source for deals? Is it LoopNet? Um, he said his favorite source for deals is um, the residential MLS because you often find residential agents who are who don't fully understand commercial spaces and have not properly valued them, and you can get a good deal that way. Ash, is that a correct summation? It is. I used to pay like four or five thousand dollars a year for LoopNet. Never found a deal on there. So now it's 100% networking or residential MLS or auctions or, yeah, but it's not I, that. I certainly don't know any uh, large real estate investors who are wearing blue polos and awkward yellow headphones who are just getting over the year of paying $5,000 to LoopNet, finding those deals and not getting anything out of it. Yeah, it's a, wa it's a waste. <laughs> certainly of don't know that guy. It's definitely not me. <laughs> Uh, another one is Crexi, C-R-E-X-I. C-R-E-X-I. It's a fast-growing commercial marketplace. What makes it good? Uh, it's free. And it's a competitor to LoopNet, so I think a lot of people are defecting and heading to Crexi. Awesome. If you find a property that's not listed for sale and you want to get uh, info for the owner so you can reach out about buying it. How do you do that? Same way you guys do auditor sites, um, networking, but you could pay for CoStar and get a lot of that information. Very, very expensive. But CoStar has all of that. Or if you know a commercial broker, hit them up, have them do you a favor. 
Yeah. Awesome. Well, Ash, thank you again for the last hour and a half of information. I took several pages of notes while you were talking. I hope everybody else who's tuned in did as well. Is there anything else you would like to add or anything you think I should have asked? Uh, no, but I want you residential guys to start looking at a commercial. Ash needs more competition. No. So really, yeah, this would hurt me, right? Having you guys in there. But a lot of you guys work so hard, have great systems in place. And if you applied that towards commercial, you would slay it. That's awesome. Where do you, uh, if I were going to go online looking for commercial rental listings, would I find most of them on LoopNet or would I need to go to Craxy somewhere else? For rentals, it would be all of the above, including Craigslist, uh, Facebook, Craxy, residential MLS. There's a ton of for leases on the residential mm. MLS sites. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, I think I'm finally run out of questions for you, Osh. Thank you again. Uh, viewers, thank you again. We will have our December best ever webinar. I believe the last Tuesday in December is the 29th. It's after Christmas. So the Tuesday after Christmas, you will have your next edition of this, um, of this webinar. Ash, uh, if you wouldn't mind, please, whatever contact info you want to share, uh, comment it in the Facebook Live video on the Facebook group, and people, you can reach out to Osh from there. Thank you all again. I'll do that. Cheers, everyone.